Thanks for your introduction. Uh, hello, I am Michael. I am from Poland, as already said. Yeah, I work at a company called Software Mill. It's rather a small company, around 40 people. And there are two small unique things about it. First of all, uh, there are no bosses. We have a fully flat organization structure. And second thing is we don't have an office because everybody works remotely. But today I am going to talk about machine learning. So basically, let's start from going back in time. So let's travel in time by 68 years to year 1950. And these were a pretty interesting times, actually. It's a time of first commercially produced computer called, called ERA 101, then renamed to Univac. It's also a time of first generic purpose credit cards. So there were cards from Diners Club allowing you to eat in 27 different restaurants. It's also a sad time of Korean War. But also one novel was published then, a novel called I, Robot. So you may have heard about this novel before, because there's actually a movie with the same name, movie published in 2004. And this movie is based on this novel. And it tells about robots, laws of robotics, and others. But also one man lived at that time. So who knows who is that? Yeah? Very nice. So it's Alan Turing. And in 1950, he has written a paper in which in the first paragraph he asks a question. Can machines think? And in this paper, he discusses different threats and challenges which stands before the whole process of the learning of the machines. And some people claim that this paper is actually a start of the whole artificial intelligence. So if you would read an article about AI history, then this is the beginning. And this paper also contains a test, test now called Turing test. Uh, initially, in paper, it was called an uh, imitation game and had a bit, dif bit different form. So in original form, machine was talking with two people uh, by paper or by text, and was trying to guess who is a man and who is a woman. And they were trying to conceive this machine. And nowadays, string test has a bit different form. So generally, some interrogator, some judge, talks with different people and tries to guess who is a human and who is a machine. And the machine just tries to, to conceive and to imitate humans. And when you think about that, there are multiple challenges for that. So, First of all, it needs to understand the language. So there's natural language processing, both for understanding questions, but also for answering in a grammatical manner. What is more, it needs to have some knowledge, knowledge about human history, human customs, how do we live, and it needs to have some preferences. So if you ask what is your favorite color or movie, it needs to be able to reply and even to discuss why this one, not another one. But at the same time, it needs to be not too perfect. Because if you ask a machine to solve some very complicated mathematical formula, it may solve this for you. But if you would ask a human, human will give you a calculator or ask if you're crazy. So there are many challenges, and no machine has passed this test yet. And there are also other tests, because um, there was discussion if this is re if this is a really a test which proves that the machine is intelligent. There are other ideas, like uh, claiming that machine would be intelligent if it could, home to, it could come to any people in any person's ha house and prepare a coffee by finding things there, uh, heating water, etc. And another idea said that uh, an intelligent machine would be able to assemble the furniture according to instructions, for example, from IKEA. And basically, I'm talking now about AI, but AI is a broad term. It's generally about intelligent machines. But the topic of this talk mentions machine learning, and machine learning focuses on only of its subset. Subset related to analyzing data, finding some patterns there, and making predictions based on it. So it learns on data to then to be, 
to be able to predict something. And also there is another subset called deep learning. And in deep learning, um, we focus mainly on multi-level neural networks. And if you would read any research papers or articles about deep learning discoveries, nowadays the real magic happens there, actually. And machine learning contains a few, there are a few categories related to machine learning, a few subtypes. So there is supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, and reinforcement learning. And let's go through them. So first of all, in supervised learning, uh, we have examples. And you can imagine an example as a row in database, in a table. So you have something which is described by attributes. And there can be different attributes. You may have numbers, you may have some dates, uh, you may have some enums, uh, some text. And there is one very special attribute. And let's call this attribute a label. And basically, in this type of learning, we want to learn how to predict this label basing on other attributes. And depending on type of this label, we were talking about classification, for example. So classification is when this label is some type of categorical nominal value. So we just want to assign those examples to different classes. So this can be email classification to classes of spam and not spam. But if this label is a number, then we're talking about regression. So if you want to become rich, you may try to predict Bitcoin prices or stock prices using regression. And then there's unsupervised learning. And in unsupervised learning, we don't have such labels. And we are more interested in a whole result of processing. So in a clustering, we just group similar objects together. But of course, there can be different measures of similarity. So we can group objects which have similar appearance. We may group events with similar location, but also we may group people who have some similar interests in social network. And then when we have such specific groups, then we can target, for, for example, a marketing campaign against a very specific group of people. Another type is a dimensionality reduction. And in this type, we just want to reduce number of attributes. So if you would have example described by three numbers, so you would put it in three-dimensional coordinate system, then by doing some mathematical transformations, it may be possible to map this to lower number of dimensions, to two dimensions, just to two attributes, without losing anything important. And now, third big group is semi-supervised learning. And it's somewhere between the supervised and unsupervised. So basically, you have labels, but only for a subset. Why subset? Because it might be expensive to get labels. It might be needed to manually put these labels by humans. So basically, uh, you have only a small number of them, but they can still benefit the whole processing. And last one, the reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is easiest to explain basic on artificial intelligence in games. So in a game, you have some initial state, possible set of moves, and some goal. And if machine, if AI makes the right moves or reaches the goal, get some bonus points. So there is some type of reinforcement. But when makes the wrong moves, get some minus points. And in this picture, you see an example from AlphaGo. It's an algorithm based on Google DeepMind for the Go game. And it was able to beat the best human Go master. Uh, it's worth to notice here that it took many years between beating the chess master and Go master, because Go is much more complicated for machines than chess. And reinforcement learning can be also applied to movement of robots. So when you have some initial location and target location, robot tries to move and omit obstacles, which would be related with some minus points. And now, other examples and use cases. So we have all those voice assistants, like Alexa, Siri, Cortona, Google Assistant. So basically, they are able to understand what we're saying. So there is voice recognition. It needs to analyze text, so there's natural language processing. But at the same time, it needs to match the question with some knowledge, with some operations to perform something, uh, to find something in your calendar, etc. 
there is fraud analysis. And in fraud analysis, um, you try usually to find some unusual things, like if somebody has a credit card and suddenly this credit card appears in Brazil spending on all, all of his money, and for sure there is something wrong. Uh, but also there's one example from Polish market where Polish government um, wants to create a system when they gather all of the invoices and then they analyze it for finding some patterns of invalid value added tax returns, for example. Advertising. So company which displays the ad on the website tries to maximize probability of clicking because it gets money only when the ad gets clicked. So they profile the viewer to know what would be interesting for him or for she. So basically, uh, they want to display an interesting ad, and they need to profile based on some cookies, and then match the best ad. Um, image captions, it's like rather an interesting example. And there's an article from Google about that. And they have made a system which is able to automatically describe pictures. So you can just upload a picture and you get a description. For example, in upper left corner, you have a person riding a motorcycle on a da their throat. So completely correct. Uh, you can read about it later. There will be more links. So driving cars. Uh, related to a lot of sensors, uh, there's a lot of research related to that, and you nowadays almost every day hear about some accidents related to self-driving cars. Um, also, NVIDIA is doing a lot of in that area. So there's a computer vision where it tries to learn, it tries to check which part of the picture is what part of the road, which is the road, what is the pavement, the road signs, etc., cetera, et cetera, to know what path it should take, what to omit, etc. And IBM Watson. So it's a product from IBM, uh, but they have put it in a TV contest. Uh, so there was a TV contest called Joe Party in the US, or in Poland it was called The Bank, uh, where you get some description, a few sentences, and you answer with a question. And actually IBM Watson was able already to beat humans in that game. Uh, recommendations. So when you buy something on Amazon or you just browse through Amazon, you may get some email recommending, like, you might be interesting in, or interested in some products. But also, if you mark some movies on Netflix or on other services that they, they, you like them, you might get recommendations, like, you might also, you may also like other movies. And the basket analysis, which is related, uh, where basically when you add something to a basket, you get some recommendation that you might be interested also in other products. And there's, a, a, there's a one legend related to this topic, uh, where many years ago there was a study when they have discovered that young men buying diapers also buys a beer. And they have, many people have tried to verify that. And there were many studies studying th this in different shops, and multiple things influenced that. Like some shops were putting together diapers and a beer in the same location. Uh, some shops were analyzing only men in the afternoon, etc. But basically, a conclusion was that it's not really 100% sure if the initial result was correct. So we don't know, unfortunately. And healthcare. Uh, there are many products related to healthcare. Um, on the picture, you, sh you see a screen from a Chinese startup called Infervision. So they have created a few products to help radiologists there. Because it seems that there, are, there is a too small number of radiologists there comparing to the po population. And uh, humans can analyze only like up to 100 photos daily. So basically, they have products related to analyzing of chest scans and brain scans to find some fracture, cancers, uh, blood clots, etc. Uh, but also, there are other applications. Like, there's a Google DeepMind, which there's a module for health. Uh, they were gathering some data in UK. And the ultimate goal is to help doctors to find the best way of treatment for patients, having some description of their diseases. 
And now the learning process. So many of the machine learning types have the common learning process, but we're going to focus today mainly on the classification because we're going to uh, implement a classification problem. So first, you have your data. And data can be located in multiple databases in multiple formats. And those, you need to unify the schema. You may have dates in US and UK format. You may have some dates saved as long, some as date type. You may have different time zones. So you need to unify this all. If you have some categorical values, then they may have some different names. If there is an enum, enum can be represented as a number or, of, or as a string. So you just unify this. And then you perform a preprocessing. And preprocessing has two stages. So first stage is cleaning. So first you check if there are some missing values in your data, if there are any nulls. So if something is missing, you have to decide what to do with that. Do you want to remove this whole example or do you want to fill this value somehow? Do you want to put there some average or median value? Or you can treat a null as a new value for some enum. And on the other side, you may have some outliers. And outliers are values which you are for sure they are wrong. For example, you have attributes which have usually value, values from 1 to 10, and you see there are 10,000. So you know this is wrong, and you have to decide what do you want to do with such value. Do you want to remove it? Do you want to do some approximation? Uh, or just uh, leave a null? So then, when data is cleaned, you do a fu future, feature, future engineering. And during the feature engineering, you add new features basing on other features. So new attributes basing on other attributes. So if you're analyzing, for example, sound files, you won't put a whole sound file in, in just attribute. You would need to extract some sound characteristics. If you would be analyzing text, then you won't put just a whole text to, to attribute. You would need to extract some characteristics to transform the, that text to numbers, etc. And when your data is cleaned uh, and you have those features, then you split your data to train and test part. For example, to 3 4 and to 1 4 of the size. And then you take this train part and you apply some machine learning algorithm to it, and it produces a model. And this model can have different representations. So this can be some decision tree, some set of decision rules, some parameter for neural networks, etc. And then you take this model and the test part, and you check how this model behave, behaves against these test examples. You check how the model can predict those labels without looking at that existing one. So you check how, what it predicts, and then you compare this prediction with this original label. And then you can calculate some statistics, some metrics, like for example accuracy, to know how big percentage of all of the examples is correctly classified. And then you decide, is it OK? Then you can just deploy your model in production, but this rather does not happen. Or if it's not OK, then you go back. You go back to start, and you basically change cleaning methods. You change the algorithm parameters, etc. And you go again and again until results will be OK. And now the example. So we're going to today to classify conference talk abstracts into tracks. So on some conferences, there are topic tracks, like backend, frontend, mobile, big data, etc. So I have gathered abstracts from a few conferences and put them in a CSV file. So there's basically a track name, unified track name, a title, and the text. And for that, we're going to use Apache Spark. And for start, a small disclaimer, generally Spark is a big data tool. And this means that you should, use, you should use Spark only when you have actually large amounts of data. And by that, I mean that if you can't process your data on a single node in, in the reasonable time, then it's big. 
So Spark is intended to run in clusters, so this have some overhead, and Spark has a very specific, uh, well, architecture, I would say. And Spark, of course, uh, well, for developers, it offers RDDs. And these are like dist resilient distributed data sets, and they just look like collections. So you have on them methods like map, filter, etc. But underneath, it just operates on data located on multiple nodes in a cluster. And it's quite clever, because if one node fails in a cluster, it know knows which part of data needs to be recomputed without restarting all the processing. And Spark have some modules. There is a module for machine learning, which we're going to use today. There is a module for streaming. There is a module for graph analysis. And it offers APIs in Java, Scala, Python, and R. And we're going to use, actually, today, Scala. So who codes in Scala? Oh, I suspected there would be no one. Yeah, so don't be scared. I won't show you today any monads or anything like that. And let's go to the code. And actually, it's a very crucial moment, because last time I was presenting this talk, this is a moment when the, this machine has rose against me, and the keyboard just stopped working at all. So I'm using today Apache Zeppelin, and it's one of the, the possible notebooks. You may have heard about Jupyter, Jupyter Lab, uh, Spark Notebook. And basically, it's a web application which connects to uh, Spark to some interpreters. You can execute their code, but you can also write some comments. So you can write in Markdown what are you doing and why, then execute your code, gather results, visualize, and then you can export the whole file to show you to your colleagues uh, wh what have you achieved. So here, uh, on this first cell, I'm basically running bash to download the CSV file from GitHub uh, to, to, to disk. And there, and there are some imports. And now, let's load our data. Is the font size OK for those in the deck? Yeah. So value data equals Spark. And Spark is an entry point for data frame APIs. Uh, they are a newer type APIs, I would say. And we are saying that we are going to read something with some options. So there is a specific delimiter I have used in a CSV file. And I have to say that there is a header line. And I'm saying that I'm reading a CSV file called abstract CSV. And let's cache the, this in memory. And let's, say what's, let's see what's inside. So value data equals, sorry. So z dot show data. Z, z dot show it's a function from Zeppelin just to visualize the data. So there's a table, and we see columns. There's label with the track name, title, like reactive streams per samples applied in ACA streams, and there's a text. And you can view some things, like, for example, statistics about the labels. So we have some title, uh, some uh, backend, uh, big data, DevOps, frontend, Java language, methodology, architecture, mobile embedded, and programming languages. And there's one thing I haven't told you before, that most of the machine learning algorithms require to have numerical input. So we need now to transfer this text, this label, and this abstract to numbers. So let's start with the label. We're going to use some Spark transformation. There's a string indexer, which will just transform this text to a number value. So a new string indexer. And we define some input column, which will be the, which will be the label. We define what will be the output column of this transformation, which will be the index label. And we have to provide here our data. And now we're applying the, this transformation to our data set. So we're saying that string indexer. Basically, I'm going now to apply this transformation by transformation to show you the results. Uh, but normally, you won't do this because we would be uh, many times uh, doing this. It would calculate many times the same thing. And later, we're going to define a whole pipeline to have everything in one step. So. 
We transform our data and let's see what's in the index. So we had here backend and we got value 2.0 for it. And for example, there's value 1.0 for label big data. So basically label is, is, is ready. And now I'm going to, to um, additionally implement the opposite transformation because at the end we're going to have also a numerical prediction and it would be of course easier for us just to read the text. So there's index to string transformation and we just to have to say that there's input column which will be named prediction and we're going to transform this, transform this to um, prediction label. And we have to uh, set, the, set the labels which will be string indexer dot labels. And now, uh, now we have to focus on title and text. So basically if would re you would read those abstracts and titles, uh, you could notice that title is still beneficial because sometimes there's a technology name in title and this doesn't occur in the text. So let's, let's just concatenate title and a text. And let's do this in some fancy way. So SQL transformer equals new SQL transformer. And we define here a statement which will be a SQL statement. So we're saying select all existing columns and concatenation of title space text as title and text from this. So this means that from current data frame. And we're going to apply this. So value transformed equals SQL transformer transform indexed z dot show transformed yeah there's a bug as I, I have expected sorry I have forgotten the one method name of course I have a backup if something doesn't work like it's in in, in all the live coding sessions set labels In Scala APIs, it's like sometimes there's a set and sometimes you don't need a set. So, uh, we see just a new column with those concatenated values. And now we need to split this text to separate words, actually. So there's also a transformation for that. And it's called regex tokenizer. So, new regex tokenizer set input column, which will be a title and text, and output column will be named words. And we can define here some regex pattern, which will be, for example, split on every non-word character. So value words equals regex tokenizer transform transformed c dot show words and there's a new column and there's just a wrapped array with a specific word and now you can see that there are some value some words here which are not too valuable for the processing like in we l a etc and these are just stop words so let's just remove them and there's transformation for that, and it's called stop words remover. So, new stop words remover, uh, and we define the input column, which is words, and we define the output column, which is filtered. And of course, we can provide here our own list of stop words if we would like to. Value filtered equals stop words remover transform words, z dot show filtered. And we see now that in this table there's a new 
column filtered. So in original, we had reactive stream principles applied in ACA streams. In this talk, we'll have a look. And now there is reactive stream principles applied ACA streams talk look ACA. So basically, they are removed. And now we have separate words cleaned, but how to transform them to numbers? Um, so we could think about a way, for example, that if you, you would have a whole English language dictionary, which, which would contain thousands of words, uh, we could specify a vector per abstract. And in this vector, a single position would be related to a single word, and as value, we would just store numbers of occurrences of that word. So there would be a lot of zeros, of course, uh, but also we don't have today the whole English language dictionary. And what is more, technology names are often not from English or not from any other language, so this won't work. So let's use a small trick. There's a trick called hashing trick, and there's transformation called hashing TF, which is a hashing term frequency. And I will explain in a moment what it does underneath. So basically, we have to define the input column, which is fi filtered, and the output column will be already called features. And we define the number of features to 2048. And basically, this means that we're taking word by word, we're calculating hash from the word, dividing this into uh, by uh, modulo 2048. So it's like we're dividing, ha dividing these words into 2048 buckets. And of course, we can have some colli collisions by that, uh, but we don't worry about this for now. And basically, uh, we hard called this number 2048, and, but I'm going to tell more about that later. So we expect to have output of such transformation as a vector with length of 2048. So value features equals hashing tf transform uh, filtered c dot show features and. There's a new column, but there's something else in it. So basically, Spark is quite clever, and it knows that there would be a lot of zeros, so it uses a different array representation. So this is a sparse vector. So instead of having a single array, it gives you a tuple of three elements. So there's a number saying what is the vector length, there's an array of indexes, and there's then an array of values. So basically, this means that from 0 to 38, you have only zeros. At position 39, you have value 1.0. Then from 40 to 147, you, you again have only zeros. At 148, you have 1.0, etc. So this saves a lot of memory, and Spark is able to operate on such vectors. And now we can actually uh, perform the, the learning process. And to save a bit time, I'm going to copy some block of code. Yeah. And basically, we define here a machine learning algorithm, which is a naive base. And naive base calculates probabilities of occurrences of words in spe specific classes. And it's naive because it assumes that those probabilities are independent. And we have to define that uh, the label column is this index label, so this numerical label. And the features column is the features with this uh, array of numbers. And we construct here a pipeline uh, which just defines the stages step by step what are we doing. So first, we had a string indexer to transform labels to numbers. Then we had SQL Transformer to concatenate title and text, regex tokenizer to uh, split this text to separate words, stop words remover to remove stop words, hashing TF to transform this to numbers, naive base for the machine learning, and index to string to transform this prediction in form of the number to the label itself. And then there's a split to this three-fourths and one-fourth. 
So we split our data to train and test part. And we take the train part and we apply it to this pipeline. So it produces a model. And then we check how this model works. So basically we're taking a model, applying our train and test parts to it, and we're checking what it produces. So it calculates and we see a different first row because we have done a random split. And every time we would run this, we would have something else. Uh, so first row is backend, introduction to gRPC, a general RPC framework. And we're seeing all those columns produced in one stage, all those features. And there are row predictions from naive base. There are probabilities from naive base. There is numer numerical prediction and prediction label. So for backend, we have predicted backend. And let's take a look also at the second example. Uh, so we have predicted DevOps and originally there was a property based testing for, testing for everyone. So it haven't worked correctly for this one. And now we're not going to analyze one by one if, the, if it was correct or not. We're just going to use an automatic evaluator for that. So there is a class for that. There's a multi-class classification evaluator because we have multiple possible classes. And we just define what is the label and what is the prediction. And we say that we want to have a metric accuracy. And it automatically compares those predictions and labels and gives us the numbers. So it says that for train test, for the train data, it is able to correctly classify 100% of the examples. So this definitely looks like some type of the overfit for the data. So it have learned this data set too good, I would say. So it could use some a too unique attribute. And for test, there is a 56% accuracy. Um, for first try, maybe not bad, but maybe we won't run this on a production yet. And in a moment, I'm going to tell you how could we improve those results. But first, let's take a look how can we classify some new, some new examples. Uh, so we have to create a new data frame, and we just provide the title and a text without any label. So for example, there's a my talk title. And maybe you will give me some other title to, to check. Anyone? Anything? So if not, maybe we'll try with, with what we have today. Um, Elastic search, maybe. And we're going to check. So basically, uh, if I have written this correctly, of course, we have all the labels. And of course, for Spark, we got big data for machine learning. But for Elastic Search, we got mobile and embedded. So it haven't worked correctly. But basically, it's a way where, where, where how you can apply new observations on that model. And now, let's take a look how could we improve that code uh, to get better results than those 56%. So for sure, we could have a bigger data set. Um, because here we, I had only over 100 examples. So in optimal situation, we would have thousands of examples. Uh, but also there are some other things. So first of all, we have used a, a regex tokenizer. So we have just split an abstract to separate words. Uh, but we have lost information by doing that. So when you had a big data, we have split this to two separate terms, to big and the data. So we have lost information. Um, the same would be, for example, for Java EE. This would be two separate terms. So instead, we could use, for example, n-grams. So this way, in, like in bigrams, you produce I will, will present, present big, big data, data topics. And we could combine the single terms with bigrams, and it could improve our processing. And now, uh, English language is quite simple. 
but in Polish case, with all possible flexible forms, is a bit more complicated. So this algorithm would actually treat all the, of those words as a completely different words. Uh, so there's a stemming and lemmatization. And basically their goal is to bring those words to some common form. So there is a stemming, and stemming is more like a heuristic. So like in Porter Stemmer, you just keep the common beginning of all those forms, and you cut off the different endings. So from communities and community, you could get a common. I have checked this actually. This gives a common. So this doesn't even sound like a real word. But for, for the algorithm, it would work. And lemmatization is more complicated because it actually uses grammatical rules from specific languages. And it is able actually to bring those words to a base form. So from communities and community, you get community. And then, there is a term frequency we have used today. A term frequency basically means that if some word occurs a lot of times in some abstract, this means that it's important. So uh, in this transformation, we are putting numbers of occurrences in the array. But there's also inverse document frequency. And inverse document frequency basically means that if some word occurs in a big number of abstracts, then this might not be too important. And we want to lower, lower its meaning. So this could be in abstract words like, for example, speak, because this might appear in a lot of cases. There is k-fold cross-validation. We have used a random split to three-fourths and one-fourth. And basically this means that we all, not all of the examples are in a test set. So if there's some unique example, uh, it could be put in train and you would not test our model against it. So instead, you can use k-fold cross-validation, uh, where you perform a few iterations of learning and testing. So for example, with four folds, you just uh, split your data to four folds, and this uh, every fold is three times in train and once in test. And by doing that, every example is once in test. So you, your model is checked against that. So you perform four iterations, so it takes time, and you, you just calculate the average. And this number is a more reliable one. And grid search. Because we have just hard-coded at 2048 for this number of buckets, where, of course, there are thousands of words in English dictionary. And in grid search, you just can provide the values you would like to check, uh, all possible param parameters you would like to test, and Spark would check all the combinations and would just produce you the optimal model with, with the best parameters. And when you work with machine learning, it works this way that sometimes you change something with sometimes sound logical, but in practice you get worse results. Uh, there are many many quirks, I would say, which happens in practice. So basically you have to test and check many variants, check many metrics, and then you can get some uh, reliable results. Uh, some links. Uh, first link is actually a Turing paper I have mentioned. Second link just a Spark documentation. Uh, third link is a Databricks website. Uh, Databricks offers some community platform where you can create an account for free and you can play with some hosted uh, Spark instance with some built-in notebook. Uh, link about those uh, researchers from Google about making captions for photos. Uh, about AlphaGo, and there is a link to Kaggle.com, and Kaggle.com is a website, uh, now it's owned by Google actually, but it's a website with machine learning competitions. And there are some real companies who come there, who put their problems with some data sets, and put some, give some money to solve those problems actually, and monies are rewarded for best solutions. Uh, last links is Docker uh, I was using today with Zeppelin and Spark, single Spark instance. Uh, there's Spark Core NLP, 
Spark Core NLP is integration of Spark with Stanford Core NLP library. And Stanford Core NLP library is basically a very known library for natural language natural language processing, so it includes all the stemmers, all the lemmatization, etc. And last link is just a course on Coursera about Scala and Spark. And that's all for today. Uh, if you would like to have some stickers, not only those from the picture, just come after the talk. And do you have any questions? Hello. Uh, thanks for the very good presentation. I would like to ask uh, what are the alternatives of Spark? What other tools we can use? So if you're talking about the big data, uh, and there are alternatives like, for example, of course, there's Hadoop. But Hadoop is a bit older solution with, uh, I would say, a bit dif more difficult APIs. And nowadays, we're having also, for example, Apache Flink which offers also some machine learning algorithms and batch and stream processing. And now you could say it's a direct competition in just in matter of those big data tools. So if there are no more questions, then thank you.